Okay, today uh, our topic is going to be biblical and theological understanding, and I'll explain what that means. This is, as of right now, this is the schedule of lectures that I'm planning to do. I say as of right now because I confess that I've struggled a little bit with the best way to approach that, and you're going to, you'll understand some of what I mean uh, here in a few minutes. So next week, uh, I have a talk I want to do called Inviting God to Church. October 22nd, Worship Renewal and Community. Then the 29th, Worship Wars, Traditional versus Contemporary Music. On November 5th, Liturgy and Elements of Worship. And then Worship in a Postmodern World, because the world has changed. Uh, we're not even in modernity anymore, we're in postmodernity. And then the last week, the conclusion, uh, concluding lecture, summing it all up, and then the final exam. For those of you who have not been in courses before, I will, on the fifth or sixth week, I will be providing you with a document called What You Need to Know from Worship, the class worship, and the, the tests will be only the stuff that's on that document. I encourage you, if you're taking the class for a certificate or degree, you must take the exam. I encourage you to take the exam whether you are or not because you will learn more. If you study that and you take the test, you will know more about what our topic has been when you're done than otherwise. And I promise you, I will tell you everything you need to know. Is that not true, those yes. of you who have taken the course yes. before? Everything you need to know will be on that document, so it should not be any problem. Um, I, I want to, last week we started with this sort of history of Christian worship, and my, my point in this was not to say they used to do it better than we do. I'm not, I, don't, I don't believe that's true. It's not true. But... One of the things I think we need to know is we need to have some modesty, some humility in recognizing that Christians have not always worshipped in the same way. There are historical periods. Um, the early Christian worship was primarily house church kind of stuff. It was very countercultural. It was very sort of free form. There wasn't any formality. They didn't have church buildings. And then when Christianity became legal, there were church buildings and they began to take on all of the trappings, some of which we recognize today in terms of vestments and gold, you know, altars and the whole thing, and it's also true, hey Chris, come in. Thank you. Sorry, I'm uh, Don't let me forget, before you leave, I've got a certificate for you, because oh, okay. you, you've got the Certificate of Biblical Studies. Um, the, and because of that, because it became legal and therefore became, it became advantageous to people to become Christians, and especially advantageous to become leaders in the Christian church, because that meant that you had access to, like, bishops, had areas that they you know, technically didn't own, but sort of owned, and they got the benefits from them. They lived in big palaces and everything else. This led to a lot of Christians uh, entering into monastic order, uh, or free, free form monasticism early on in, in the Egyptian desert, because they felt like Christianity had lost its spiritual basis because of all of the way it was being done then. And on and on. You know, the shifts through with printed press, through the written, written word being read more, to the Protestant Reformation, where there was even more of an increase in verbal communication as part of worship, to the, um, the Enlightenment, focus on rationalism and less on ceremony and ritual and, you know, the, the, the moving kind of parts of it. And then 19th century, the Romantic movement brought emotion back into it, and that's where revivalism and, you know, and, and uh, real emphasis on music started. Um, then in the 1960s, of course, contemporary music hit the scene, especially in the U.S. and in down under, Australia New Zealand. And then today, there's this, this mix of it. We're going to talk about traditional versus contemporary worship later on in our course. Um, and I shouldn't even say verses, because it's not, really a comp it's not really any problem anymore. I mean, there, were a period, there was a period in the 90s and early 2000s where it was a huge deal in terms of the differences in, in worship style. I restate all of that because that's, that's a fairly academic kind of understanding of the history of Christian worship. The more I have studied for this, the more I have read for this, the more questions I have. I can do, I mean, I could do this as an academic course, and we could talk about more about the history and about, you know, elements and what's been used, but that's not where I want to go with this class. And so as I was preparing for this, I realized I have so many questions that are not that are not ac academic in their answers, and I think that today's class is called a biblical and theological understandings. I want today, and I thought some of you have as much experience in worship, even in leading worship in some cases, as I do. So today, I want us to sort of take off the gloves, 
And I have a bunch of questions for you. And so you're going to do most of the work today. <laughs> I want us to look at questions and relevant scripture verses appropriate to those questions. Not exhaustive, because there's a lot of scripture verses having to do with various aspects of worship. But I think that whenever we get into definitions uh, of what worship is, and I gave you a bunch of them last week, I, I said that sort of the short definition of worship would be reverent honor and homage paid to God. And I said that, and we went on. What is homage? What does reverent honor mean? Some of the other things. Um, Christian worship is primarily and essentially an act of praise and adoration. In the most practical possible sense, what does it mean to praise? What is adoration? Do we really even ask ourselves those questions? I don't think we tend to do that. We read scripture verses on that, or we, you know, we read definitions like that, without ever really saying, what does that look like? And how do we know if we're doing it? You see, it used to be very simple in terms of worship. And we're going to look at a bunch of Old Testament and New Testament verses. But in the Old Testament, worship was very simple. You went to a specific place, the temple. Okay, this is before, I'm talking before synagogues, which synagogues were never places of worship so much as prayer and study. You went to the temple and you did certain things. Particularly, you sacrificed animals. And the blood was sprinkled and you did, you know, you, either the sacrifice of animals or you poured out drink libations of offerings or you gave grain offerings. Um, you, both in the Old Testament and even in more modern, uh, like Catholic and Orthodox worship, you went to a certain place and you did certain things. You crossed yourself. You genuflected, which is to kneel, especially when the cross comes by. Uh, honor. You knelt down for part of the services. Most Protestant churches, we don't do any of that stuff anymore. We certainly don't sacrifice animals or drink libation offerings or any of that kind of stuff. We don't, you know, we don't fall on our face like they used to do. We don't uh, prostrate ourselves. What does it look like when we worship and how do we know if we're doing it right? See where I'm going with that? So the first question is, what in the most practical terms possible is worship? I'm asking a question. I want some answers. Yes? Giving praise and glory to God. Giving praise and glory to God. What does that mean to you, Lydia? What does it mean to give praise to God? What does it mean to give glory to God? To lift Him up, to honor Him, to be thankful for all He does. To me, that's like you worship him, you uh, honor him. Okay. Um, I, I should go ahead and do this, by the way. Oh. Since you since you said <laughs> praise the Lord God. To me, worship is uh, recalling the attributes of God and uh, he is he's so many things. There's so many names in Scripture. For him, so uh, bringing uh, bringing to mind that he's Almighty, Prince of Peace, Wonderful Counselor, uh, Light of the World, you know, uh, uh, majestic, awesome, all these things. So uh, when I pray, I I praise him for his attributes. Okay, Bob, do you want to come in and sit, or do you need your wife for something? He's giving me a banana. Okay. <laughs> The first thing she's had to eat in three days. The okay. banana delivery has occurred. Thank you, sweetheart. Okay. I said you're fine. Thank you, sweetheart. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I, I see. I, the, it's interesting. Lydia said is to praise and glorify God. So, what does it mean to glorify God? We have in Psalm 96, ascribe to the Lord the glory to His name. How do you ascribe to the Lord the glory? Bring an offering and come into His courts. We don't do the offerings anymore. Um, worship the Lord in the splendor of His holiness. Tremble before Him all the earth. We don't do a whole lot of trembling either. Um, to praise God, I bow down and worship the Lord. So to praise, do you need to bow down? I praise the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who has led me on the right road. So, um, I mean, you mentioned focusing on the names of God or the attributes of God. Do we do that as part of our worship or is that something people are expected to do individually? 
Do you want to your hand up? Did you raise your hand? Oh, okay. Uh, yes. I do it individually. I think we should do it corporally because I think it helps me. It's a description of God. It just it, it's, it helps me to bring, in my opinion, it, for me, it brings me into His presence. Mm -hmm. Okay. So when I pray, I start out with all of the scriptures mm -hmm. of God because it helps me to come into His presence of who He is. And I think it's in that sense it also settles my my soul and body to focus on God instead of oh the refrigerator's running the dog's over here you know right all the distractions. <clears throat> okay, who else? What do you think? Maybe the, maybe a corollary is a question would be, do we do this in the hour on Sunday morning when we specially set aside for corporate, or do we not? Yes, Joan. Well, you do worship God corporately through the hymns, some of them, if you pay attention to what they say, you know, like, holy, 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 Lord God. Assuming they say something, which some of them nowadays don't. <laughs> but if they say something, you pay attention to what they say, then yeah, we are corporately worship, worshiping God through the, the songs and through the, the melody, which also helps us to focus our mind on God and uplift our thoughts to it. Okay. I think this is, I, I agree with you, but some people have taken that thought so far that, and we mentioned this last week, that for many people today, um, worship means the singing part of the service and not the rest of it. You know, they talk, we talk about the worship band. Well, is the person reading scripture or preaching, are they part of the worship band? Or the worship team, sometimes they say? So, I, I don't disagree with that, but have we followed that definition to the point where the other parts of it aren't really considered worship anymore? I mean, I don't, I don't know, I'm not, I don't think somebody is saying, oh no, that's not worship, but have we just sort of fallen into that without being conscious about it? But I think it's, I think it's both. Okay. But I don't know, different churches, I'm sure, do different things, but... I personally think it's both. You know? Do most Protestants today spend time focusing on the names of God or the attributes of God? Or <laughs> does that mean, if the answer is no, then does that mean most people aren't really worshiping? You see, I, I'm, I'm really, I'm seriously asking these questions because yeah. these are questions I ask myself and I think we, can, we need to struggle with them together. Yes, Lydia. I think sometimes it becomes my name. The same thing. You do the worship, you read the scriptures, you you, you take the offering, you sing, and, and you go. And to me, that doesn't seem like worship. Okay. You mean like it becomes a habit? It becomes a habit. It becomes mundane. Yeah. You go, you do it. It's almost like a Catholic church. I call it stand up, sit down, fight, fight, fight. <laughs> <laughs> worship songs, really worship songs, mm -hmm. where they give praise and glory to God. It's just beautiful. Mm -hmm. It's really, really beautiful. But the words have to mean something. If you're just there and you're reading the song and you're singing, if you really don't feel it in your heart, and I don't mean a feeling of, mm, wow, but if you don't feel it in your heart, to me that's not worship. Is there a downside to that kind of charismatic worship? I've not found it. Okay. <laughs> Well, you were talking last week about, um, I think you said some of the praise songs are like, Jesus is my boyfriend. Yeah. You know? And that really, I, I've been thinking about that a lot this week, and I can see why why you would say that. But I also come from a charismatic background where people do tremble before the Lord, people do lay prostrate before the Lord, and I have not seen that in other mainline denominations, right. nor in, nor in you know, the Catholic Right. Church. Yeah, there are charismatic Catholic churches too. You know, yeah. Right. Right. Well, is there is there a danger that we begin to put too much emphasis on, for lack of a better word, emotionalism? Mm -hmm. See, I have known some charismatic people, yes. friends of mine, who I really feel for them it became the next emotional rush yes. was what I they were looking for. I can see that. Yes. Yeah, that could happen. 
Because oftentimes, people that, and I can speak to that because I have that background, people that are from the charismatic background cannot sense the presence of the Lord or feel the presence of the Lord in a, in a service like a Presbyterian service. Where because Rodney and I are missionaries, we have a, a great opportunity to be involved with many different denominations. And you know, I can say that I have sensed the presence of the Lord and sensed that people were worshiping in all denominations. But I can see what you're saying. A lot of times if you don't have that emotional high that goes with it, what about if we're just tithing? Mm -hmm. Or we're reading a liturgy or, or responsive reading or something might not have the same emotional right. high. That, uh, what if we saw giving an offering or, you know, the tithes and offerings as being our time of sacrifice? Would that change it? Chris first and then Mike. Yeah, first off, I think praising and glorifying God and worship has to do with entering into God's presence. It kind of doesn't... Yeah. Let's see, what does that mean? I'm not challenging those expressions. Okay, well, entering into God's presence to me is that you become... You connect with Him. Yeah. And that you sense, in, in, in your worship or in your prayer, that you really sense His presence. I mean, it's not like a tangible thing. It is a tangible thing, in a sense, to the person <laughs> yeah. who comes, who feels. It's a real it. experience. It's a real experience, yeah. and you you sense his love, you sense his his love and care for you, etc. Um, so I think, and I also feel that different that different people are different. Some people are kind of experiential, and that's what they honestly need. Other right. people are more. Um, To say academic, that's not really the word, but it's more their their connection to the Lord is the word and theology and things like that, and that's how they connect. Yeah, I mean that's why personally I find that different denominations. I think the Lord allows different denominations to exist, to exist because people are different, any different. Thing. I do too. But so I think the charismatic um, side of things. I think for some people that just really does it, and it. And it really connects them to God right. deeply. I think for other people that's kind of put up because they're different kind of people. But I don't think there's, you know, that one of them's right, one of them's wrong. I think in either one you have to be a little careful. <coughs> of, um, yes. Extremism. Extremism. Yes. Yeah, so yes. It's a little like all of a sudden you're so kind of in the study that you miss the presence. The presence. Right. So in the same way that it's possible to be hyper-emotional, you exactly. could be hyper-rational. I, mean, I, I, yes. I, I think okay. there's extremes of this. Okay. First of all, Mike had his end up signal. I was going to say, I was, I was a member of a church that was charismatic, and I came to Jesus at that, at that church and through the charismatic movement. And I switched churches later on to a Baptist church, and a big Baptist church with a big choir. And I, joined, and I was sitting in the audience, and I didn't feel the spirit moving in the worship in the, in the audience, but when I joined the choir, I did. I felt the real power there of the Spirit, the presence of the Lord in the choir. And I also said almost all the, the choir was, was a closet charismatic. Okay. Uh, <laughs> charismatic. Yeah. So there's kind of, okay. Okay. Je here first and then and let, let, go ahead. Go ahead. We talked about hyper rational versus, versus hyper emotional. Was it something like really? I'll, I'll think of it. Okay. <laughs> I think whatever that worship has to be uh, genuine, it has to be open, and it has to be uh, acknowledging all those essences of God that the magnificence, the uh, omnipresence, all those essences, uh, so that we as human beings are humbled as we, we truly are and um, are opening ourselves up to a magnificence so that we can honor and praise and do all those things. If we are doing it because this is what we do, uh, then that's not a whole lot of honesty. If we are doing it because um, it makes me feel good to be doing something uh, in honor of God, then that's not really fulfilling the whole component of open communication. 
communication with God so that you can worship. Like if you don't have open lines of communication, it's like just reading the cover of the book. You know, mm -hmm. You're not getting into the essence of it. Okay. See, I, I said that the the worship wars, as they call them, that is the conflict between traditional and contemporary worship, is mostly over. And the reason they were wars is because in the 90s and early 2000s, people who attended a tra who traditional services thought, you know, that the people who went to contemporary worships were shallow and stupid. And the people who went to contemporary worship thought the people who went to traditional worship services were, you know, old and decrepit and, and, and stupid. <laughs> Well, they, they, we've pretty much stopped the name calling now, you know, and the pointing the fingers. Now they would usually they Christianize it some way, you know. Well, brother, you know. <laughs> but um, but still, that's basically. And we we sort of have started giving latitude to the idea that different people find meaning in different ways. Mm -hmm. I believe there are reasons why there are different denominations. I think there are way too many of them. You know, yeah. I, I, the small town my parents lived in that I lived in during junior high school and high school. There were two Southern Baptist churches that were literally within a stone's throw of each other. I mean, you could, I could stand at the door of one and throw a baseball through the stained glass window of the other one because some, at some point in the past they'd had a fight and some of them marched off and started meeting under a tree and they built their own building. So there's two huge brick Baptist churches that, well, there's, you know, there's some serious problems when you yes. run into that kind yeah. of thing, right? And I think that too many times those sort of multiplication of churches, multiplication even of denominations, can be not honoring to God, even dishonoring to God. But in principle, I, agree, I completely agree with what Chris said, that pe different people are moved by different things, and I believe God gives us the grace to be able to, to exercise that. And there also is something quite brilliant, you know, one of, the, one of the problems with that variety, with that, those options is, people leave churches because they don't like something somebody said, yeah. or, yeah. you know, they don't like the way somebody looks, or, you know, um, whatever reason. I mean, people have left the church for all sorts of things I've done. Um, and so I, I think there was some advantage back in the days when there was one parish church in your community and you all went to church together because it forced you to deal with what it meant yeah. to be brothers and sisters in Christ. And now, if you don't like something, you just run away. Okay. So that, that's sort of a different issue, but um, you had your hand up. Yes. Right. I think before before Sunday, okay, before a worship service, if you have not worshipped during the week on your own, before the Lord, uh, in his, seeking His presence, um, it's much harder for those people who have not to come to church and all of a sudden worship, because they haven't been in God's presence during the week, they haven't, they haven't sought after Him. And, you know, the, the verse, uh, my heart says, seek his face. Oh, Lord, I will seek your face. Um, to seek him during the week, uh, to be in prayer, so that when, when Sunday comes, or whatever day a service may be, uh, you're ready for it. Your, your heart is ready. And you, I am moved by scripture. I am moved by music. I am moved by sermons. Um, and sometimes it's not all in one service, but the Lord is speaking to you, as Chris was saying, in certain ways. He just addresses something to your heart, but your heart has to be prepared. So those who are unprepared, who come to church with empty hearts all week, well, okay, I'll go to church on Sunday, I'm there, you know, fellowship, and, and I'm out of here. <laughs> Um, they're not ready for they're not ready for true worship. <coughs> it sounds like we're drawing a distinction, um, not not an exclusive distinction, but still a distinction between personal worship and corporate worship. Is that fair? Yes. 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 Sure. And that there needs to be some elements between the two. And I let think me. They're very connected. Yeah, very connected. Yes. I mean, it's really what we were just saying. If you've not experienced personal worship, you're not going to get anything out of corporate worship. <laughs> which is probably why a lot of people don't go to church anymore. Um, let me, I'll but two or three of you attend Lakeside Presbyterian Church. Let me, let me make this very specific and very personal. 
are we doing, and I'm not, I'm not asking, I want you to tell me the truth, I'm not asking to, for compliments, I'm not asking for criticisms, I'm just asking for this to be, because I'm, I'm looking for us to develop a very practical sense of what it means to worship. So it helps, I think, to make, give a practical example. Do we have appropriate or fulfilling or meaningful worship on Sunday morning at Lakeside Presbyterian Church? And I'm saying, for those of you who don't attend here, you wouldn't have any idea, but most of you do. Because I'm trying to say, what is and what isn't meaningful worship? Or even real worship? As opposed to going through the motions. Or just doing it because, you know, that's the way they always did it before. Lynn? As a relatively new participant at Lakeside and a new member at Lakeside, there's some things that um, I miss. Um, I miss being able to come into the sanctuary and having the quiet time to prepare for the service. Uh, you know, Belle was playing music and she's a, a wonderful musician and we can sit and enjoy it if we do nothing else than that. We are enriching our lives. Mm -hmm. But to be able to prepare for worship in uh, quiet and solitude, all the chatter out there is wonderful. It's it's a blessing to all of us, especially those of us who live alone. But to be able to come and talk to 25 people in 10 minutes and get 25 hugs that really feel a part of things. But then when I come into the sanctuary and it's continuing on and you're saying, hey out there, <laughs> oh, it's time to get started. I find it very difficult to enter into a sense of worship, a sense of presence. Uh, okay. So I need that personal quiet time so that I can become part of the, the, the normal worship that, that we are having. And then little things like, um, I'm Twice I've done responsive readings and twice I've had to bite my tongue because I really wanted to get a little intro so that people can be in the moment of that particular scripture. Mm -hmm. uh, and so when we're reading the responsive part, they are doing it with some sort of awareness rather than just words. It's certainly not a criticism of the way things are done here, because that's the way things are done in many, many Protestant mm -hmm. churches. Well, the, the, one of the reasons I'm asking is because we want to do it right. And at the very least, we want to do it better. <coughs> now, and again, I'm using it as an example because that's about that's a practical example gives us, I think, lets us latch our fingers into a real thing instead of just a theoretical thing. Anyone else? Join in. Um, I kind of have mixed feelings about that as part of it. I, mean, I do want to enter into God's presence when there's all this distraction and uh, it's harder. But I think it's my responsibility mm -hmm. to tune that out, to sit down, take a deep breath, and basically meditate. You know, prepare myself. I think that's an individual responsibility. Because the other side of me would miss it if it was just silent, quiet, go in and sit down and worship. Because I'm not sure that I would feel part of the fellowship. And that is very important, I think, again, especially for those of us that live alone. But even if you don't, you can be alone and be in a whole big family. Right. Um, so well, I think, really, I think we need to have that time out there. And that's up to us to get here, you know, however many minutes early. Yeah. So, but it's an hour early so that we can have that time. Okay. But, but Ross sure. gives us time when he says, let us take a few moments to reflect. It is our responsibility to go into that reflective moment. Yeah. And you can't make people do that. And people that well, just come to Sunday church because it's Sunday and that's what you do, right. you're never going to capture them because it's, it's an individual God heart thing. Yeah, I, I, I still mean, you know, we can still say there's a 15 minute period right before the service where we encourage people to come in for a quiet you know, preparation for worship. You know, we can do something. And yet so many people have this idea about what is Sunday morning about. I hadn't thought about this until right now, but at the Pastor's Forum um, recently, the, the part of the lectionary, I read the Gospel, and Jesus' reference was to divorce. That divorce, basically he was saying divorce is a sin. Well, the lectionary is read without any introduction and without other than, you know, 
the gospel reading is from the ninth chapter of Mark, etc. Well, he said, you know, you read that, you don't give any explanation that we don't really hold to that anymore, and which is not true, by the way. Yeah. You know, divorce is a sin. Yeah. It doesn't mean you can't be forgiven yeah. for the sin, you can't be healed from that. You don't have to continue to carry that burden, but it doesn't make it okay. Um, and, and he said, you know, you read that kind of thing and don't, don't tell them that it's okay and that we're, we don't, you know, we don't abide by that so strictly anymore. And they'll think this isn't fun and we want them to think it's fun. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Is that, you know, Mike, you had your hand. I was going to comment that, that uh, the responsive readings, I was raised in the Episcopal Church as a young, young person and I never liked that. I just thought, I just tuned that out. And, and, and I still tune it out when, when we do it in the church. I, I go in and I pray in tongues and, and, and just ignore it. And that's what I have to do. But I think something more, it says, when I bow down and worship the Lord, you're humbling yourself when you bow down. That's, that's an expression of humility before the Lord. Mm -hmm. I, and when I come to church on Sunday, I come to honor God. And I, and, and I do it where, where I am and, and what and I follow the procedures that are going on in the church generally. And that's, that's an act of, I'm honoring God and I'm honoring Him for, for the week. That's okay. what, I, what I do with it. Um, well, we're going to come back to this. I mean, we're going to be talking about this in the next today and six more weeks. And I want us to think of it in terms of, I don't just want this to be an academic exercise. Some of our classes are quite academic, you know, because this is a school, uh, the Instituto. But some of these are very practical matters, and I want us to really deal with some of this. I'm, I have a bunch more questions I want us to talk about. Um, first, why should we worship? Right. To establish relationship. Okay. That's the purpose. Um, Psalm 100. Shout, shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. We don't do a whole lot of shouting in Presbyterian churches. <laughs> If, if we, if, <laughs> now, the issue, and this is always an issue that I as a pastor have to deal with, is it's like when, when they brought a set of drums in that they were going to use in the Spanish language congregation. I had one woman say, great, we're going to have drums, and another woman immediately said, you start playing drums and I'm out of here. You know, like I said last week, it's like, okay, if this turns into a nun bar, I'm out of here. It's, uh, so how do you balance that kind of thing? So. Shouting would be one of those things too. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before Him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is He who made us and we are His. We are His people, the sheep of His pasture. So, um, He made us. We are His. We are His people, the sheep of His pasture. Is that why we worship? Are there other reasons? He's worthy of worship. Okay. Lydia? Yes. Okay. He did more than ask us to, he told us to. Yes. Yeah. Um, there is that aspect of it. If you're in the ethics class, you know that we talk about that there are a lot of different sort of normative principles, and one of them is uh, called deontological ethics, which means there are rules, and you have to obey the rules. What God told us to worship. Right. Are there other reasons why we should worship other than God told us to, and he deserves it? Well, I think fellowship. I think um, I think it strengthens our faith when we are around other faithful ones. I mean, you go out into the world, and all of your neighbors and your coworkers and whoever else you encounter during the day are, are not necessarily, probably are not, in a lot of cases, Christian. So I think we need, I do, I, believe, I need that reinforcement that there are other soldiers out there. Okay, good. Uh, every Sunday morning I say we are here for two reasons. One of the reasons is to, to be brothers and sisters, to enjoy the fellowship that comes as being part of the body of Christ. And those of you who attend have heard me say that. I said, but the main reason we come is to worship the Lord our God because He is worthy of our worship. He alone deserves our praise. Okay? Is that, does that ring true with you all? Or is there something missing from that? Kenny, you, you, you had your hand up. Well, I was just going to say perspective. When we worship the Lord, we get a better perspective of who He is, who we are, and in light of Him, um, we worship Him and we begin to get a better perspective on our situations that are going on, especially right. if we're going through a difficult time and remember that He's still on the throne, so to speak. Right. So I think um, as, we, as we worship, an important part of that is, is to set our perspective. Okay, Mike? And we also petition uh, His assistance and, and, and petition for His will to be done. Yep. 
Yeah, a lot of times, I'll get to both of you. Um, one of the models I think that is most useful, and it's primarily because of the order for prayer, you've heard of the ACTS prayer, A-C-T-S. The initials A-C-T-S stand for adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication. Supplication is asking for what we need. The idea that prayer is first to adore God, to worship Him, to praise Him, to acknowledge His greatness. Then secondly, we confess our own sins. Third, we give thanks for all that He's blessed us with. And only after we've done all those things, started first and foremost with adoring God, and then <coughs> confessing our own failings and sins, and then thanking Him for all of His blessings to us, then we ask Him for the things we need. And I think that order is, is brilliant. Mm -hmm. And yet, too often, and I, I don't disagree, we are here for petition. You know, that's we, we with the pastoral prayer that we have every week. And, and again, I'm using us as an example, not because it's the only church in the world, but because most of you know it, and I want us to, to anchor this in something, something real, um, is we, in the pastoral prayer, we first thank God and then we ask, but we have other, you know, we have a prayer of confession. We have uh, opening prayer of adoration, and we try to make it, etc. cetera. So, um, yes, first here and then Chris. I think that um, many people don't realize that worship is not only for God, but it's for us as well. Uh, and as Kino was saying, uh, uh, it, it's, um, it's our, den our identity in Him, uh, who we are before Him, and, and how awesome He is. And I don't think the majority of people realize that worship is it's not just worshiping Him, it's for us as well to acknowledge, you know, I bow down before you, I humble myself before you, I know who I am, and yet He loves me. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, I quoted, I quoted last week, and, uh, and it's become sort of the standard definition for worship amongst the Catholics. Pope Pius X said, worship is for the glory of God and the sanctification and edification of the faith. First, yes. glory of God, but then for the sanctification, meaning make us holy, more holy. And edification means to make us better. Um, and I, I like that. I think that's a good definition. Chris? Well, I was just going to say that I think part of the heart of worship is just grateful. It's like being, having an awareness of who God is and what he's done. I mean, just looking around at the world. Just look at the lake, you know, look at the trees, look at the cloud. Kind of <coughs> seeing God all around us all the time and being aware. Of it. And, and, and thanking him and, and just glorifying him for who he is and for what he's done. Okay. I mean, I think it's just, it, 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 it's rooted, though, in really the understanding of who God is and, and really acknowledging that in your life, that how much he participates in your life, how much he loves you, all of these things put together then should express itself okay. in, you know, in praise to him, to worship him, to break things. Okay. Um, I've got lots of other questions. <laughs> Does it matter where we worship? I had a friend who used to say, I can have communion with a hot dog and a Coke in a park. Yeah. Do you agree with that? Mm. Depends. Is he sitting on a bench and in prayer? I mean, I don't know. I'm getting nods, I'm getting shakes. <laughs> tell, tell me why you're nodding or shaking, respectively. Chris? Well, I think it, I think it, it, there's certain, like, communion, there's a certain ritual to it. The Lord sort of, you know, here's wine, here and bread, hot dog, Coke, beer. Right. I think at what point does it become too profane, meaning yeah. you know not holy? Right. Yeah. Right. So I, I mean, I would think that having said that, you know, if you're in a certain situation and all you have with some bread and some bread and some tea, well, I mean, I think you could probably be doing yeah. it because you're doing something from the heart, not just tossing it off. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's my opinion. other thoughts. Well, I know that uh, I have horses. So a lot of times on the weekends, we would go off, you know, camping with our horses up in the mountains. But for me, you know, I would worship while I was preparing my horse to take off in the morning. Because it was me and just my horse thing. But for me, it was actually my time to be talking to God. So, mm -hmm. you know, all of that. So in that sense, I have to say, no, it doesn't matter where you worship. But I guess that's because that's my individual time. Because I wasn't in town where there was a church. 
Yeah, in the Old Testament, as I said earlier, worship was very clearly delineated. You did it at the temple. There was one place. There was the church of the, there was the tabernacle before. But then once the temple was built and sanctified, you know, they, they, they uh, blessed it and the, the, the Shekinah glory of God resided in the temple. Then they were very specific. In fact, there are four or five different verses where they quote Hezekiah as saying, there is one place to worship and it's at the temple. Uh, but you also get um, this reference from 1 Kings where they're talking about uh, David. And David bowed in worship on his bed and said, praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel. He's giving thanks, praising God because he's anointed Solomon to be his successor. So, um, yes, Lynn. In the Psalms, does David uh, not, coming from his heritage as a shepherd boy, does he not talk about the stars and moons and their doors? <laughs> the glory of God will be known in the, you know, in the, yes. in his creation. And then in Psalm 18, he definitely uh, is talking about the magnificence of creation and uh, the amazing God. He also, he also talks about the fact that, you know, the, the um, blessing of being able to go to the house of the Lord. Yes. yes. So, you know, I think this is, this is a both and, is my understanding, is that there are places that are especially set aside and sanctified as places of worship. And we should hold those, we should have reverence for those uh, places. This, you know, we, we always say, well, it's just a building, uh, this church or any other church. It is just a building, but you know it's a special building. And you know, if, if, if a storm blows it down tomorrow, then we'll be sad, but we will not feel as though uh, something, something has been, something of God has been taken from the earth. We, but it is a place that we have reference for. Um, and yet, we can worship on our bed, or with our horses, or whatever, I think. You know, those, all of those things are, are true. Um, so, Lynn? I think we, we must remember this discussion, too, at the time of David and those ancient peoples, God said, build this temple and I will live there with you but separate from you. Right. And, and <coughs> so the building had this tremendous importance, tremendous yeah. importance to them as, as a people, but as a place of worship. Um, and we don't build the church as a structure to put God inside and say he's over inside here, we have to go there right. to be with God. Yep. Because we had um, been exposed to God and, right. and Christian love in, well, the, the whole universe. Yeah. There, is, there is no temple now, you know, and this is not the yeah. temple. There are no churches, the temple, in the way that the temple, the glory of God was resonant in when, when in, um, <clears throat> Jeremiah, in writing the book of Jeremiah and Lamentations, Lamentations, he talks about seeing the glory of God, Shekinah glory of God, literally rise up from the temple and depart before it was destroyed because of the sinfulness of the Israelites. So, yeah, it's just a building, but I, anybody who's been here, one, you know, once or more, has heard me talk about the fact that this this building becomes a testimony to the glory of God mm -hmm. yes. because it's a testimony of the faithfulness of His people. And Paul talks about that, writing to the Corinthians, he said, "Your." Generosity and giving to the things of God, which are visibly evident in, in a building like this, are a witness to Him and will cause thanksgiving to God and will bring Him glory. You know, so all of those things are true too. There's also a danger. One more thing. Um, I agree. You know, God. Scripture says God is manifest in the glory and beauty of His creation. There is a danger. A lot of people will say, "Yeah, I worship the God who is in the mountains and the trees and the lake and the rivers." That's pantheism. That's not Christianity. God made those things. He is not in them. Okay? There's a difference between the creator and the creation. Those panthe panenthe uh, pantheistic or panentheistic uh, philosophies and religions, you know, like um, some of the Far Eastern religions, um, maintain that these things are God or that they are at least part of God. That is not Judaism. It's not Christianity. And the only reason I say that is because people who say that sometimes don't realize that they've stepped over a line. It is still true that we see the beauty of God's creation and we can see the glory of God in it, in, in, in His having created it. And, and His glory is reflected in it, but He ain't in it. Okay, Mike? I was going to comment that the, <clears throat> the Jews have the tallit, the prayer shawl, 
And that, that's, my understanding is that's a substitute for the time when they used to worship God in the, in the tent, on the, in the desert. And that, that, that was a substitute for the tent. So, so they were bringing the, the tent into the temple. Yeah. Okay, I was not aware of that. I do know that you know, some of the other symbolism, for instance, the reason why, why Orthodox Jewish men always wear a hat, Either you know, at the very least, even underneath the you know the bigger hat, they will wear a kippah or um, yarmulke. Yarmulke, yarmulke. Um, it is because that's a symbol of the fact that there is someone over them. It's always a reminder that they you know they are not completely free of the covering of God that's <coughs> above them. Okay. So there's no one place for us to worship anymore, but the places we worship are important. Mm -hmm. you know? um, another question: Are there specific actions? That should be part of worship. Okay, on Sunday. <laughs> okay. <laughs> She's been waiting. Well, I had, uh, I said at, at our last class, silence. You know, if we just had a little more time. And Sunday, you gave a little more time. I do listen. <laughs> I know. And I was so grateful for that. But I thought, ooh, just a little more time. <laughs> just a little bit more. Maybe we should give out of earplugs, and then people can take them out whenever they're ready to listen. To them, so. <laughs> yes. so I, um, that, that silence gives us just an opportunity to enter into his presence, to uh, meditate. Worship to prepare us for worship. I agree. And do you think think about it is before you take communion, yeah, you, you have that moment of silence. Now, all I can say is their list of sins is a lot shorter than mine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 I can't get them out. I can't get them out either. <laughs> we knew that, Mike. <laughs> I knew you'd do we that. <laughs> Um, yeah, and th there's always a balance there. I mean, yes. th th there's always a concern, you know, I mean, it's not like we directly affect this, but there's always a sense that if you go too long in silence, somewhere yeah. in the back of the congregation, I'm going to hear, <laughs> <laughs> yes. and, uh, um, so, yeah, there's balance in there. Um, any, are there other actions that should be part of worship? Again, th uh, there are some traditions of worship where kneeling, yeah. standing, you know, um, coming forward to take communion, or are there other things there should be, Lynn? I think perhaps things that should be are very few, but they they center around the, the communion table. You know, the reminding of how we are blessed with this um, ability to take part in this. Um, Ceremonial Should communion be given more than once a month? Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> should it could be, but yes. Ross, don't you should on yourself or on us. Oh, I'm, yeah. I'm a deontologist. I believe that there are oughts. There are categorical imperatives. <laughs> you you just sat through that lecture. You know it. Yes. Right? <laughs> that there we have duties to certain things. Okay, Lydia. Okay. Again, going back to the charismatic movements in, in the churches that I that I have attended. I've all been charismatic until I came down here. But to me, and this is my feeling, doesn't he say to lift up your hands? But the Lord hands. Is, mm -hmm. Why should we be afraid to lift up our hands and give the Lord praise while we are worshiping him? There aren't too many hands that go up. And I don't mean jumping up and down in the aisles, but just lifting your hands mm -hmm. to give him praise and glory and feeling that. Feeling when I lift up my hands, I can feel <coughs> His presence. Yes. Okay. I, I'm having been a charismatic. I, I miss the altar calls where people come to the altar and they they anoint them and they pray over them if they're ill or something like that. Where yes. the elders yes. come down the, the line and pray for everybody. I miss that. I really do. <laughs> and that's something I consider instituting after services too. So, um, lifting the hands. Something sort of related to, to this. Does what we do with our bodies make a difference in our worship? Mm -hmm. I think yeah. so. I guess so. Yes. Yes. Depends on the person. Well, didn't you just say lifting your hands makes a difference? Yes. Okay. It depends on the person. Some people may feel it. Some people may feel awkward if they've never done it before. I remember the first time I went into a charismatic church. I wanted to run out the door. 
scared me to death. <laughs> I was like, okay, I did no. But as I started attending more and more, and 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 being as he is baptized in the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues, it's it's just wonderful, you know. But this is my experience, and I love lifting my hands up to the Lord because to me, it's giving Him glory. It is. Um, I'm offering myself. Okay. I, I want to get some of you who aren't saying very much to talk to. Chris, you haven't said too much. Well, I was going to say, I just came back from India and I was at a conference of about 100 missionaries. And a friend of mine was the worship guy, you know, the worship leader. And he's, he has tremendously beautiful and meaningful songs. Um, and I was in the back, I was going to speak later, but I was in the back. And, and, I watched people as they were worshiping as he was singing, and it was like, you know, some people raised their hands, some people did this with their hands, other people didn't do anything, and I think the beauty of it was people could do as they felt led. Yes. Like, they're, because everybody's coming in from, you know, there wasn't one denomination yes. or, or anything in particular, um, there wasn't any overarching sort of unwritten rule that you do this or you don't do this. And I think expressions of at least of raising your hands or speaking, speaking in tongues you know, lightly so it's not freaking people out. He's only it in order, is that? Yeah, it's it is, is, if there's no overarching thing against it or it's encouraged that people just express it the way they do, I mean, as long as they're not yeah, interrupting other else. people. Are disrupting. I mean, that's what yeah. Paul was talking about, is yeah. to be yeah. disruptive yeah. with it is a problem. Yeah. But it's, it's like, again, yeah, it's sort of like, People express their love for the Lord, or the, what actions they do when they pray. People are different. Some people, you know, they're going to fold their hands, and they're going to, others are going to bow their heads. Some are going to raise their hands. And, and I think creating an atmosphere where all of you know, where it's not if it's not disrupted, that it's accepted, acceptable. That allows people to kind of express their worship the way they do. Yeah. C.S. Lewis said that um, human beings are amphibians. What he meant by that has nothing like, like a frog. A frog lives on land and lives in water. What Lewis was referring to is that we are spiritual beings in a physical body. He makes the point of saying we fail to realize that what we do with our bodies affects our spirits. That there is a link between our body and our spirit. That we are, you know, we are sort of bifurcated. He makes a special point of saying most people think that we're physical beings who have a spirit. No, we are spiritual beings. That's the part that's going to last. We are spiritual beings who have a body. But that what we do with our body, I mean, science knows that what affects us spiritually, and by that I mean the aspects of spirituality like psychology, you know, the psychosomatic illnesses and all that. In other words, what happens to us on the inside will affect our body. Well, the same thing is true. What we do with our body will affect our spirit. Have we lost a lot of that? Yes. Because we don't raise our hands. We don't kneel. We don't bow down. We don't prostrate ourselves. Mike? One of the things I notice is that when people are feeling the spirit a lot of times, they, have, they gently rock and they, and they move back and forth. Like choirs, when they're, when they're, when they're really getting into it, yeah. the whole choir is rocking. You know, it's it's just dancing just before, you're dancing before the Lord the way David did. Okay. You're doing that. And, it, and I've noticed that that seems to be universal. That, I mean, Christians, when they're really feeling the spirit a lot of times, they would rock. Just ever subtle. Not, not, on Sunday, excuse me, Pastor. Um, when you uh, were in prayer, or you know, in a prayerful attitude, and you had your hands together, that was so beautiful. And you, you do that, um, maybe at communion time, I believe. And I'm not sure if, what the order is, but putting your hands together or clasping them together. But this is what you do. And I just think that is so beautiful. It's it's like a, just a holy moment. Well, and when we do the doxology, I frequently will do this yes, at least for a minute. See, if I got my hands any higher, I'd have people leaving. Remember when we we were loved up, and one of the chapters said um, is referring to our hands. And how when we get up tight or are uh, not open to suggestion and all those things, our hands are closed, just consciously, unconsciously. And sometimes we're even fingernail imprints in our hands and just clasping them so hard. I find that 
I cannot be, I might come to church uptight and tense and bothered by things, and that's a good reason to come because you can just leave them all here mm -hmm. and go home knowing that you're not. You can get mad at the pastor and forget whatever else was bothering you. <laughs> Sometimes I get mad at him too, and I just laugh and say, Isn't he great? <laughs> to just consciously say, I must open my hands. And so I often sit through a great deal of church service with my hands open, maybe not raised, but open and on my lap, and they will tingle, and my heart will be uh, at peace, and my mind is so open that any message that is in the scriptures or in the spoken word, whether it's sung or spoken, is just um, magnified and really has me. If I sit there like this or like this, um, it ain't gonna happen. Okay. <laughs> This passage from Luke 2, a uh, description of when Jesus was taken to the temple to be, um, you know, to be, to be presented when he was a baby, uh, talks about um, two uh, uh, older holy people who were there. And one of them, there was also a prophet Anna, the daughter of Penuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was very old. She had lived her, with her husband seven years after her marriage and then was a widow until she was 84. She never left the temple, which means she probably had been a widow for 70 years, given out, you know, her 60 years or something, 60, 65 years, because when they married. She never left the temple, but worshipped night and day, fasting and praying. Do we fast as part of worship? Or do we only do the worship things that are more comfortable than that? Should that be part of it? Are there other things that we should be doing as part of worship? Either personally or in preparation for corporate worship? Uh, a Presbyterian church that we had attended in um, California, uh, when there was a particular, when there was something important to really pray about, or before Easter, uh, often uh, there would be, or we would take 24 hours, okay, of the time of prayer, uh, and there was certain certain times that the church would be open and that we. We could just go in there and be alone. And we would sign up that we would pray for an hour or pray for two hours, yeah, right. whatever it was. Uh, there was something so special about that, going into the church and just spending that time. I'm committing this time, Lord, just to seek you um, and to come before you with this request, whatever it was. And that fasting was part of it. Uh, that... Uh, that, I think, is deeply moving um, to many people who, well, if you haven't fasted, you don't know what it's like and what happens when you fast. But when you fast, uh, yes, you're hungry, but uh, God is feeding you. It's, yeah. You have to be there. One of the purposes behind it, this is true in Christianity, it's also true in Islam, why they fast for a month during the daylight hours yes. in Ramadan, is to recognize that eating is not the most important thing for you to do, that there are other ways in which you need to be fed, okay? Um, another question. I'm going to do a couple more of these, then we'll take a break. <clears throat> what constitutes false worship? Matthew, Jesus said, you hypocrites. Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. What constitutes false worship? What does it look like? Just doing it for show. Just doing it for show? Mm -hmm. To impress other people with what they're talking about. People could be sitting home in their boxer shorts waiting for the game to come on, but they show up here. But are they doing it for some other reason? Joe? Yeah. When you say, what does it look like? I don't know to us if it would look any different because we can't see into people's hearts. Okay. It's where your heart is. So if the definition of worship there's a, a definition here. I got a Bible dictionary today at the thrift store for like 10 pesos. And um, it says um, that uh, worship it may be broadly regarded as the direct acknowledgement to God of his nature, attributes, ways, and claims, whether by uh, praise and thanksgiving or by deeds. So if you are doing something that, that looks like worship, 
coming to church on Sunday or singing in the choir or fasting or, or putting money in the, in the offering that looks like worship, but you're not doing it for the purpose of acknowledging and uplifting God, then that would be false worship. Mm -hmm. Okay. You're doing it for social reasons or some other thing, but you're not really concentrating on God. You're not doing it to Him. Yeah. You're doing it so your neighbors can see that you put something in the basket or, you know. Now, th this is um, this is especially true in parts of the South where I grew up, where if you're not a member in good standing in church, don't expect to get promoted, you know. <laughs> don't expect to be successful in your business. If you, you know, if you own a business and you're not involved in the church, then don't expect most of the people to, you know, they'll go someplace else for their business. I mean, it really is a big deal. That's why in a lot of them, Southern Baptist Church, for instance, that I was involved in, they will have directories of businesses of their members because the people will go to the business of the people who are part of their church before they'll go somewhere else. I'm not even saying there's something inherently wrong with that unless people are involved in the church for that reason. Right. And some people don't. Yes. You know, yes. because there's, in, in parts of our country, the U.S., <coughs> our country, some of you are Canadian, um, in parts of the U.S., it is very much an issue of social standing, whether you were involved in a Christian church. Okay? Um, we've already sort of, we've dealt with this one already. Does worship require us to bow down or at least to kneel? And we have an example uh, throughout Scripture. I mean, I've, I've picked out one Scripture for each of these, and some of them, there are dozens. In Second Chronicles, Jehoshaphat bowed down with his face to the ground, and all the people of Judah and Jerusalem fell down and worshipped before the Lord. How many times do we see people fall face down as an act of worship? And I'm not saying I'm going to recommend that people do that on a regular basis on Sunday morning at 10.15, you know? Because <laughs> I have a whole different set of problems. <laughs> but do we do it at home? I remember a story that, um, oh, his, head, his name just went out of my, um, the four square pastor in Southern California um, who's written some hymns. He wrote Majesty. Oh, uh, hey, Hayward. Yeah, Jack Hayford. 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 Jack Hayford. Jack Hayford spoke once, in, and I've told this story many, many times. I've only got ten stories. I tell them over and over again. Okay. Uh, just change the names. <laughs> <laughs> no, the Jack Hayford spoke at the World Vision Chapel when I was there. And he, um, I, I think he's a great man. And he said, um, we was talking about judging. And he said one day he had had a really terrible day at church. Everybody was griping at him. Everybody had a problem. He couldn't do anything right. He said, I was so frustrated and so upset. He said, I came home, walked in my den, and I turned the TV on. And it, somebody at his house had put it on Channel 40, which in Southern California, that's Trinity Broadcasting Network. And so it's, you know, uh, Jan and Paul Crouch. Well, Jan Crouch is pretty close to Tammy Big Baker. Huge, huge hair. It's white with blue tints, heavy makeup. Oh, yeah. And Jack Hayford tells the story of himself. He said, I turned that on, and I thought to myself, why would anybody want to be like that? <laughs> and he said, I don't often say I've heard God's voice, but in as real a way as I've ever heard God's voice, I heard him say to me right then, you don't like the way I made them, do you? <laughs> and the reason I'm telling that story is because Jack Hayford said, I fell on my face in my study in humility at my pride before the Lord. How often do we fall on our faces before the Lord? In confession, in praise, in for any reason. It doesn't have to be here. Or in do you do we do it in our dens or in our living rooms or in our on our mirror doors? Do we ever? Have we ever tried it? <clears throat> One more question, then we'll take a break. Does true worship require sacrifice? It's a sacrifice of praise. It's okay, sacrifice. that sounds easy. Sacrifice of time. You're sacrificing your time. You're sacrificing yeah. your time. Yeah. So it is. A that sounds easy too. Well, um, okay. some it, people it's not. Well, I, Carolyn and I used to watch. Um, the TV show Angel. You know Angel, yeah. Joss Whedon, oh, yeah, it's about yeah. the vampire. I mean, yeah. we were big Buffy the Vampire Slayer fans of Angel. <laughs> hey, there have been twice as many doctoral theses and, and academic papers written about Buffy the Vampire Slayer as any other media no. event ever. Oh, my. 
but it's it really is brilliant. I mean, there's a lot of stuff there. Anyway, I, I'll, 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 I'll teach a separate class about that. And the nature of good and evil and empowering of people and all kinds of stuff. Lack of fear. I mean, it's, it's, anyway, on Angel, there was this site like there was this kind of goddess figure that had shown up, and I remember a lot of details. It's been so long ago, but I do remember one thing because it struck me at the time. They ended up doing this sort of interdimensional thing, and they come upon this people that had been worshiping this goddess who now had snuck into our dimension. And the, these people who were there and had been worshiping this goddess, they were jealous that she had left them and gone to a different place. And so they were angry that the goddess had left them. And one of them said, we have been worshiping her since before you existed as a people. And one of the characters said, what do you mean by worship? And he said, I mean the thing that worship has always meant, sacrifice. That's what it meant to the Jews. Yeah, that's true. And when we say sacrifice, it wasn't easy. In fact, they had, they had a sort of a sliding scale in terms of what you were required to sacrifice based upon how wealthy you were. If you were too poor, you could do doves, which were cheap. If you were wealthy, it had to be larger animals, goats or sheep, or even bullocks, bulls depending upon your wealth. In other words, it needed to be something that was going to sting a little bit. It wasn't just, it wasn't easy. Now it's true, I mean, there were places where the king sacrificed tens of thousands of animals at once and didn't hurt a bit. But does worship today, either does it or should it, involve sacrifice? And I, I appreciate what you're saying. I mean, sacrifice of praise, sacrifice of time. An hour on Sunday morning is not a big sacrifice of time. When people say, Oh, you know, I was really tired, I couldn't come. Or, well, the game came on at 11 today, so I couldn't come. I'm thinking, and what are your priorities? <laughs> really? You know, I had a friend of mine, a dear friend of mine, if she ever watches these videos, she'll know what I'm talking about. I used to teach a class at 8.30 on Sunday mornings. And she was a professional woman, and I... I never gave her any grief, I never said anything to her, but she must have 50 times said to me over the years, gosh, I know I should come to your class, but I, on Sunday morning I just cannot get up for an 8.30 class. And I always thought to myself, what time do you have to be at work Monday through Friday? <laughs> Where are your priorities? Is there not some sacrifice called upon for worship? And in case people say, oh, well, sacrifice was the Old Testament. Then. Romans 12. <clears throat> One to two. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. What do you think that means? I think at the very least it means getting up in time to go to church <laughs> on Sunday morning. I think what? it means giving of your money. Giving beyond sometimes what you your budget says. Maybe you cut out your eating out or your fund money or. Yep. Um, yeah. C.S. Lewis was once asked how much should a Christian give to the church, and Lewis said, "I don't know how much it should be, except it should be more than you can afford." Um, I think you know she was talking earlier about lifting your hands. Sometimes pride is a big sacrifice. Yeah. Uh, coming up front, whether it be to the altar to kneel and pray, whether it be to accept Christ as Savior, as some churches do, or whatever, that's a sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Because we're sacrificing um, our pride and what we look like in front of other people. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we're sick, and it's a sacrifice, you know, to, to stand during the service. Mm -hmm. You know, there are all kinds of sacrifices that people don't even see. Yeah. Um, By the way, Grace Contratus, who's taking some of our classes, she, they asked her to have surgery on Monday, and she said, can we have it on Tuesday so I can make it to class on, on Monday morning? <laughs> but she, um, people were really shocked when after her, she had very serious arm surgery, and it actually hasn't worked. She's going to have to have more surgery. And somebody said, I'm really shocked that you're at church. And she said, I always felt like if you can go to the doctor, you can go to church. <laughs> Chris? I was going to ask, in this case, worship... Is it, like, like my response to this would be, well, giving your bodies a living sacrifice, so holy and pleasing to God, is not just like when you worship, it has to do with your life. It does. Your everyday life. Like, your life, is, I think, is also meant to be worshipped. The God that you live in the way that, 
commercial stuff. I agree. So I would think here um, it would be, you know, sacrificing your time, your money, helping people, you know, doing the things that you should do as a Christian. Right. Yeah, and at the very least that means getting it to come to the worship well, yeah, service on Sunday sure. morning. Yes. But yeah, you're exactly right. I mean, part of what this does, a living sacrifice, and, and that is your true worship, that may cause us to redefine our worship as not being something that we do just at certain times, yes. but rather something that we experience all day long. Mike? Yielding to the Spirit is a living sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Think about it. Following the Spirit. Is a that it's not spirit. about me, it's about Him. Yeah. You know, but what he, He's called me to do. Um, I see this too as, this is a uh, verse dear to my heart, uh, is really surrendering. Uh, and surrendering is sacrifice. Right. Surrendering all that you know of yourself and asking God to reveal, uh, the Holy Spirit to reveal more to you. Okay, what is there about me that that I need to let go? That I need so that I might be more Christ-like. Perhaps uh, what do I need to sacrifice? Yes, yeah. what do I need to sacrifice? Yeah. Um, there was a, there's a pastor and theologian from the States whose name is escaping me right now. Um, and I remember he wrote that we are told to offer our bodies as a living sacrifice, but most Christians expend most of their energy trying to crawl off the altar. Oh, trying to what? Crawl, crawl off, off the off altar. altar. <laughs> okay, let's take a break for 10 minutes. All right, some more questions. What does it mean to worship in spirit and in truth? Because Jesus said in John 4, He's speaking to the Samaritan woman, um, he's, and, and she said, you Jews worship, worship in Jerusalem, we worship on this mountain here, you know, etc. And this, so there's a longer version of this, but the passage that, because uh, I can't put it all up. Yet a time is coming, Jesus says, and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth. What does that mean? Holy Spirit's moving you to in your worship. That's what the, the Spirit. What if He doesn't? But you notice the Spirit is capitalized. The S and the Spirit is capitalized. I know. But what if He doesn't? I mean, do we sit around and wait for Him to do something? Sometimes. Okay. Sometimes, and, and, and that you know we've heard about waiting on the Lord. Right. And I don't think that typically we are comfortable in doing that anymore. We we're a fast food society that wants the Spirit to move. Immediately when we ask him to, we're not going to sit around 15, 20 minutes, let alone an hour. Right. Who was the, the sort of coarse comedian years ago? He died, but he, he his thing was he was known for saying, Serenity now! <laughs> that was George Carlin? That was, well, um, he had, yeah, you, he had been, Seinfeld. It was George's father. No, but there was yeah. there was a comedian that I think that yeah. did it before that, yeah. He, um, he, George okay, Carlin. Anyway. No, not George Carlin. It was, it was, um, the guy, the guy was featured in Stiller and Mira. Stiller, ben, ben Stiller. Stiller's father. Okay, well, um, ben, no, that's Ben Stiller. You're thinking of Ben Stiller and Ann Mira with parents. Um, His parents. Ben Stiller's father is the one who said serenity. Um, um, yeah, but there was a comedian who did it, and I remember it because he was featured in the Wittenberg door because he had been a youth pastor and then lost his faith. Uh, so. Yes, serenity now. Okay, that's um, so. If we say that worshiping God in the Spirit means the Spirit moves us, and we must wait for it, what does it mean to worship Him in truth? To know who He is. To know, you know, no Scripture, no, no who, um, who God is. Some of you have said nothing. I want to get some reactions from some other people. Don't want to. Okay. Yes, Rachel. I, I have maybe way off. Would it be like a humility with an open heart? Okay. To know that, hey, I'm coming to you with an open heart. Right. You know, with no ulterior motives, perhaps. Exactly. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Are we doing that? Are we worshiping in spirit and in truth on Sunday mornings? Or? We really can't tell because you don't know a person's heart that's sitting in which Are you doing it? <laughs> okay. Would it be... Like that saying, to thine own self be true, are you really telling him what's really in your heart? Are you being truthful to God? Mm -hmm. How do you know if, you've, if you're if you not worshiping in spirit and in truth? You're making an honest try. You're really making the effort. How do you know if you're missing it? No, I, I do. I don't feel fulfilled. Yeah. Okay. 
It's shallow. It, it's shallow. I mean, and I know I felt that. I mean, it's like, you know, I can't give God a one hour time frame, but there are times I leave and I go, I didn't, I don't, I don't feel I was in the presence of the Lord. You know, I, I missed it, you know, for whatever reason. I get distracted. I mean, I'm and you feel that was something in you, not something in the service or no, whatever? No, it's not the no. service. It's me. And, and I'll give you a perfect example. And I struggled with this before I became a deacon. I thought, <coughs> and then I'm going to need to bring in the flowers or set up the cookies or da-da-da. <laughs> so, you know, I get up in the morning. I am just going to get around. Da, 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 da. Just, I have to work really hard to get my spirit to let go of all of that. To worship, and I struggle with that. You know, maybe I just need to say no. Well, then who's going to do it if we do? So I know it's an individual. Something God is dealing with me. And you just need to learn to discipline yourself to do this. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I, I I hear you. I feel the same thing. You know, sometimes, <laughs> obviously, you know. And, but does in order to be able to worship in spirit and truth, does that mean we can't have any other responsibilities? Obviously not. If you're yeah. a leader of some kind. Um, what else? What, Chris? Well, yeah, I think it's, it doesn't have just, I, I don't think it means just the time when you're worshiping. I think it has to be, you know, in truth, has to do with just living it. As well. living it's a more permanent life. situation. It's, yeah, yeah, because I mean, it, it's not, I mean, it's great to come and worship God, you know, and to do that, but your life has to be worshiped as well. I mean, in other words, you have to, you, if you just came on in on Sunday morning, have a little prayer, and you worship, and leave, and you don't live out your Christianity, well then to me, that's, that's not enough worship. Yeah. Yeah. How much, how, we've already talked about this a little bit, but I want to poke it a little bit more. How much emotion is necessary? How much uh, theological reason is necessary for us to worship in spirit? Can we worship in spirit and in falsehood? Can we get it wrong and still be? Yes, we could get it wrong. Okay. I think we could get it wrong. Okay. What does that mean? Despite our best intention? Well, for, okay, what do you mean by false then? Well. What's your definition? Where, um, okay, I'm gonna pick on the charismatics in the group. <laughs> The charismatic churches that believe that you are not really filled with the Holy Spirit unless you speak in tongues, mm -hmm. that's not biblical. No, no. Not. Good, I'm glad you all went okay. <laughs> because there are a lot of people who believe that unless you speak in tongues, that you are not filled with the Holy Spirit. Um, if somebody believes that and believes that because somebody is not speaking in tongues, or they're not speaking in tongues, you know, I'm not speaking in tongues, that this, I'm not really worshiping, well, that's... That's theologically wrong. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Can I still worship if I got it theologically wrong? That's what I mean by can we worship in spirit, but in, you know, not and still have it wrong. I Something. think we have a lot of things wrong. Okay. <laughs> you know, I mean, really, well, how yeah. do we know? We're so small compared to him. I think the the to me, what the key thing that you said was best effort. You know, I am sincerely putting forth an effort to worship God, not only on Sunday mornings, but in all of my life. I'm going to miss it. I'm going to miss it because we're humans and we're fallen. You know, that's just right. the way we are. But I think that when we are honestly seeking Him, that, you know, that counts for something. Okay. Yeah, I've, I have often said when people say they're struck, they don't know what to do in a situation. Um, Henrietta Mears, who sort of created the American Sunday School movement yeah. from Hollywood Presbyterian Church in California, um, she used to say, you can't steer a parked car. No, this was before they had power steering. <laughs> but um, you can't steer a parked car. In other words, if you're, you're, in order to steer in a certain direction, you have to be moving forward. And so that her principle was that if you're not sure what direction God wants you to go, you've got to be moving forward, and then he'll tell you. And yeah. my uh, sort of in addition to that, I've always said, I'm perfectly willing and often do say, Lord, I'm a poor dumb sheep. I don't, I'm not sure what to do here. I think this is the right thing. And so in faith, I'm going to move in that direction. If that's not the right thing, I count on you to steer me somewhere else. Okay. 
Uh, so I, I, and that is a confession, you know, that's a confession of, uh, a humble confession of the, the potential for getting it wrong, but expecting that God will honor that. That's what, what you were saying, right? One of the things that praying in tongues, I was taught about praying in tongues, is that praying in tongues sometimes, if you don't know what to pray, mm -hmm. you go to tongues, it's kind of like a little starter engine that starts the bigger engine that, that gets, gets things going. And, yeah. and get you on, on the track to pray the way you should pray. Well, Paul what, talked about his words deeper than we can understand. So. Uh, <clears throat> Oswald Chambers, in his book, My Utmost for His Highest, uh, I love the phrase he uses, that if God, if you believe God is speaking to you to take a particular direction, and you're not really sure, he said, but if you believe He is speaking to you, go in reckless abandonment. And I love it. I loved that because I thought reckless abandonment in Jesus. Okay, if you believe that truly He's leading. He'll and if and if it's you and not Him, He's going to let you know. Yeah. But just recklessly abandon yourself to Him. I think that's that's a fabulous phrase. Yeah. I, I another story that I've told before. <clears throat> um, I had a friend who was a banker in Seattle. And he knew, some, he knew one professor at Regent College very well. And he really thought God might be calling him to go to Regent College, get his Master of Divinity, become a pastor. He was, he was fairly high up as a banker. He was quite successful, a single guy. He was offered a position from Seattle to go and work in the Wells Fargo Bank in Texas, which is where he was from originally, with a huge raise. So he was not going to be making just a lot of money. He was going to be making a lot of money. And he said, I'm, I'm not sure what to do. And so we went to dinner one night. And um, we were talking about that. And he's, I'm not sure what God wants me to do. I feel like I should be a minister, but does he want me to go back? And I said, well, have you tried putting out a fleece? You know, the, the Gideon story. You know, if you know the story, he put out, he said, God, okay, if this is your will, I'm going to put out this fleece, which is a sheepskin. And in the morning, if there's dew on the, on the fleece and not on the ground, I'll know it's your will. Well, the next morning, there was doing the fleece, and I'm like, oh, I go, okay, that's great, but I want to be really sure. Yes. <laughs> so I'm going to put out the fleece again, and, and tomorrow morning, if there's fleece on the ground, but not on the fleece, or if there's dew on the ground, but not on the fleece, then I'll know it's your will. If there was dew on the ground, not on the fleece, it was his will. And I said, so I believe that's very biblical, obviously, and so if you, what could you think of that you feel is unlikely, even, you know, um, to and say, God, if this happens, I'm going to know that you want me to go to go to Regent, take the classes, and become a minister. Again, if he ever watches this, he'll know who I'm talking about. It's pretty specific. And he said, well, I'm, I'm getting ready to go to my high school reunion. And I became a Christian after that. Nobody there knows I'm a Christian, or that, you know, that I became a Christian. And they knew the old me. And he said... To me, a fleece would be if someone were to come up to me and say, I am really moved by your Christian faith. I am really affected by the fact that you are a follower of Jesus. He said, that would be a sign from God. And I went, okay. We prayed about it for just a minute. Talking. A woman walks up to our table. <gasps> this restaurant, it was in the Weston Hotel in Seattle, specifically. There was a lower level, and then there was a wall, and there were cafe curtains up here, and there were other tables up there, so we couldn't see them, they couldn't see us. But you could hear people. Yeah. This woman walks, she walks to us from the cash register. So this was immediately after we had said, he had said this, and we prayed, you know, a brief prayer, Lord. She came up, and she said, I just had to come over here, uh, gentlemen, you don't know me, but I'm a Christian. And I was sitting up there a few minutes ago, you know, we've... My friend and I finished, and I went and paid the bill. So she'd been in the other part of the restaurant while we said that. And she said, I just had to come back over and tell you how moving it is to me to have two adult men talking about being Christians and loving Jesus. I'm so inspired by the fact that you would sit and talk about that. I can't tell you. <laughs> and I had chill bumps yeah, then. Yeah. I had chill bumps then. <laughs> My friend went to Texas and became a richer banker. I don't even remember the reason for telling that story now. <laughs> uh, but the idea of, you know, are we, are we really serious about, you know, being, being steered by God? Really? Carolyn. Um, 
I, I had to look it up because I didn't know where it was. Deuteronomy 4, 28, if you, uh, from there you seek the Lord, your God, you will find him if you seek him with all your heart and with all your soul. So yep. I think that's kind of what you were saying. Yeah. If, you, if you seek him with all your heart and with all your soul, you're, you're doing it. Doing the best you can. Yeah. Yeah. I, and I agree with that. And I think that that constitutes worshiping the Spirit and truth. We really are doing it with the right motivation, the best we can, and asking Him to, to direct us. Um, the Israelites continually, no matter how often God talked to them, continually worship false gods and idols. Do we do the same? Oh, yeah. Oh, sure. yes. How so? We worship our cars, we money. worship our money. money, we worship Starbucks coffee or Tim Horton coffee. We worship all kinds of gods. Stupid stuff. How do we worship them? Well, they become do we prostrate important. ourselves on the ground because we haven't had our first cup of coffee? Well, you know, well, we never be saved in the restaurant. I'm not going to church. Well, it might take a minute if I swing in and get a Starbucks coffee. You might be three minutes to church, which was more important. I chose the end. What this might be? The cup of coffee, or, maybe the or saying I'm not going to be able to tithe for the next six months because I really want to buy this car. Yeah. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's a real one. Yeah. If you're yearning for something and longing for something uh, on this earth, or you whatever it is. you don't want to give it up, or you don't want to give it up, you're hanging on to it. Uh, it's an idol. It's, a, it's your little god. You shall not make for yourselves an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, your God, am a jealous God. Mm -hmm. Eric Hoffer is an American philosopher who wrote a book called The True Believer. He's not a Christian, not as far as I know. But he has said something I've never forgotten. I'm always, I think about it a lot. Hoffer said, whatever you think about most is your God. Mm -hmm. What do you think about most? Your kids, your job, your stock portfolio, whether it's going up or down. What do you think about most? Is that a false idol? You, do we have to sacrifice a goat in front of a picture of George Clooney and you know and Kate Upton in order for us to be worshiping false idols? Or do we do it all the time? Comments? Chris? It basically has to do with your priorities. Like, like you do have to work and you do have to do all of these other things. I mean, there's nothing wrong with having a car, blah, blah, blah. But I think it's where you put your priority. Mm -hmm. and your, as long as you have your first priority being God and you know, your life, you're trying to live your life in accordance or in right. alignment with Him. And then you're not putting the thing before and then you're probably okay. But it's right. really, you know, like you said, it's what's the most important? What do you think about the most? Place? Yeah. I, and, and I'm not suggesting that having a new car or George Clooney or Kate Upton have something inherently wrong with them. I have had people in the church tell me, you know, make sure we don't run late on service because the ball game starts at 11.30 and i got to get home. I mean, they were serious. They were completely serious. <laughs> I had, you know, and, and so where's the thoughts during that? Oh, exactly. I mean, what's the priority here? Uh, and I've I've had people we go seven minutes late, ten minutes late. I've actually gone late a couple of weeks in a row now. Um, we go late. They come up to me afterwards and say, you know, you've got to get old. You got to stop at eleven. Wow! Oh my goodness! Really? Really? Is that the highest priority? Mm -hmm. And it, and what does that say? I've heard it said that the chip. Just so much checklist, it would reflect exactly where their idol or yeah. priorities are. Exactly, you know, where where do you put your money? They, they say that the strongest nerve in the human body is the one that connects the heart and the pocketbook. <laughs> <laughs> um, what you know, expanding this a little bit from individual in terms of false gods and idols, mm -hmm. um, you know, and it's interesting to me that that. One of the most popular TV shows for several years in the United States has been American Idol. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't like that name. Does that is there you know what does that mean to us? And here and the reason it's American Idol is because we idolize musical celebrities, and so here are people who are doing everything in their power to become musical celebrities, and they have musical celebrities deciding who's going to be the next musical celebrity, right? 
is that reflective of something in our culture? Or is it just good, clean fun? Yeah. Well, our, our, our culture is full of false idols. It really is. Yep. And, so. and, and they lead us down the primrose path if we, if we allow them to right. do that. We'll be constantly being tempted and led in various ways. Right. You know, massive materialism. Madison Avenue is trying to get you to hook on to the newest car. All those marketing people. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> those marketing people. Look, preaching and going to Midland. <laughs> <laughs> hey, she's supporting us now. I can't complain. Um, yeah, it's, and we have all kinds of vital. And I, I do think for a lot of people, it's it's... I said earlier, I quoted Eric Hoffer, whatever you think about most is your God. Maybe a corollary to that would be whatever you worry about most is your God. I know people who are constantly fearful yes. that the stock market is going to fall so much that they think their retirement money is going to be gone. I know another dear brother in the Lord whose money all got taken away, and he recently told me, the Lord will take care of me. I'm not worried about it. That's the right attitude. Where? What do we love most? And let me ask you, uh, beyond that, beyond the personal kind of gods and idols, what, what does a false church look like? What does a church, a Christian church, who really is getting it wrong look like? How do churches go wrong? Mike? We emphasize money. Money for this, money for that. You know, they're constantly uh, dunning their... Their congregation for money for this project or hey, that project. Hey, wait a minute. <laughs> Sitting right here. No, it's a, there's a balance to be struck. And, and what I'm saying to you is, is uh, some of that you have to do and, and to, run, to be able to run a church. But there's also carrying it to an excess level, yeah. too. And, uh, you know, the, 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 the television ministry, some of them, that, uh, you know, send you $100 for a prayer shawl or which is made out of paper. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, see, I, I feel considerably greater freedom to ask people to give to the church, the buildings of the ministry of the church, because I, I don't get paid anything for this. And, I'm, you know, and, and it's, I can remember my father, who was not a church man. He became a Christian very late in his life, like in his 80s, uh, before his death, but was not a Christian as I was growing up. And he always would say, those ministers are always asking for money because the more people give, the more they get. I never have to worry about that. At least not right now. <laughs> I'm open to suggestions. <laughs> no. I, and it does make a difference, okay? Uh, I'm always, I always feel like I can be bold in asking for people to give the things of God in this church, either finish the building or the feeding program we just talked about, you know, that we're launching or whatever. Keenan? Um, I'm thinking about not practicing what you preach. We have a leadership that is... Um, speaking biblical truths from the pulpit, but are involved in blatant sin. Um, that's sitting uh, right here. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, a cult. Of, yeah, know, I, I agree. I agree. I mean, I, I've known I've known of ministers who um, their secretary left their husbands, and they were living with a minister, and the minister's still yes. in the pulpit, and he's still doing you know mm -hmm. preaching every week, and everybody seems okay with it. Now, Paul talked about that. Paul writing to Corinth. Yeah. He said, what is wrong with you people? You've got a, a man who's, who is sleeping with his, his um, stepmother, and you're all okay with that. Okay? So yes, there are examples. I mean, we're all still sinners. No matter, you know, ministers are still sinners, and we still have our, our faults and failings. But when we're, when we're blatant about it, you know, because I, I want what I want, yeah. then we have a problem, obviously. Yes. Twisted versions of the word. Yeah, mm -hmm. coming from the pulpit is what okay. an indicator. Also, something else that I've noticed is that some, some churches that are false, uh, the pastor sometimes is, is building a, a pyramid to himself, if you will, uh, by yeah. a big building project, you know, a multi-million dollar church. Sit right here. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. <laughs> but but they, they go on a building project because they, they think this is a monument to them. And, 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 uh, and they're building a monument to themselves. Right. Uh, I can joke about it because I really don't feel that way. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. um, no, there are reasons why we're doing that. But yeah, I, I, I don't disagree with that. Um, 
if they don't preach Jesus as Lord. There you go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the number of ministers who openly say they no longer believe in God, yes. and yet they're still in pulpits. Yes. Those are servants of the devil. Okay, obviously, those are obvious false churches. Mm -hmm. But churches where the concern is more for social standing, is more for how things look. Um, a woman in our church, a couple in our church, used to live in South Africa. And going to a Christian church in South Africa with white minister, predominantly white congregation, she, very concerned about the needs of the poor, she started inviting uh, black families to come to church with her, including prostitutes. And she told, uh, the Sunday, those of you who were here, where I preached the sermon on, if you love me, be generous. And I talked about, the, you know, we actually had somebody come up to a Mexican family and say, you shouldn't eat so much at Second Sunday because you didn't bring enough to justify that. Um, and there were several other examples in our own church. And I, and I got very upset about this, very emotional. Uh, and I was criticized for that, too, for being too emotional. Um, but when I preached that and I said, anything that we have here is for everyone. And everyone is welcome to it, whether they brought anything, whether they have anything. We, are, we don't charge for anything for people to come. I mean, from time to time, you know, we might say 50 pesos or something to help pay for blah, blah, blah. But uh, ordinarily, we don't, you know, people are welcome there. And so I feel very strongly about that. And she came to me, Carolyn and I actually, we were at dinner at a couple's house. And she said in South Africa when they were doing this, um, some of the white people in the congregation started complaining. And the preacher actually preached a sermon against other people coming there and that he supported the, the white congregants who said the black people should not get any refreshments until all the white people had had there. Oh, and he, oh. he supported that. Uh, that's an accurate representation, right, Carol? Oh, yeah. uh, and she said when I preached the sermon I did, on the, you know, uh, that to, if you love me, be generous, and got upset over some of our actions, which are not nearly that bad, she said she was weeping because, you know, she said... We have a pastor, and oh I'm not goodness. bragging about me, but she said, you preach the sermon about, you know, the way Jesus would want us to say it, not the way that guy did. Yeah. Well, do we, do we allow ourselves to be driven or controlled by what's socially acceptable or our standards or whatever? Mike? In the, in the town I came from in Austin, Texas, they had a church where the, the sermons on Sunday were directed by uh, polls being done by the church. And it was being praised by the local newspaper. Uh, you know what a great church this was, and what a progressive pastor this was. And he was do, what he's doing is deciding what he would is, he was going to preach based on public opinion polls. It was a, and I was horrified. Sorry, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> and, they, and he also avoided sin. He didn't want to talk about sin. Yeah. Well, we have. The, I, there was a minister here in town who refused to preach from Paul because he didn't like Paul. He didn't agree with Paul, so he won't <laughs> preach from Paul. Maybe that was a conviction. <laughs> um, the Israelites were ordered to kill all false worshipers. Worshipers are false gods. What should we do with idolaters? Pray for them. <laughs> Pray for them. Okay, and this is the passage. If your very own brother or your son or daughter or the wife you love or your closest friend secretly entices you saying, let us go and worship other gods. Let's go to the game. Let's not go to the church. Gods that neither you nor your ancestors have known, gods of the people around you, neither near nor a weather near nor far, from one end of the land to the other, do not yield to them or listen to them, show them no pity, do not spare them or shield them, you must certainly put them to death. Your hand must be the first in stoning in putting them to death, and then the hands of all the people. Stone them to death, because they tried to turn you away from the Lord of your God, and brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Then all Israel will hear and be afraid, and no one among you will do such an evil thing again. What is the verse on that? Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 13, 6 to 11. How should we deal with people who are trying to draw us away from God, the things of God, trying to turn the church into something it shouldn't be, we believe? Causing us to focus on the wrong things. Rachel? We need to just turn them around and bring them to God and say, you know, this is your opinion, however. Right. Listen to what I have to say, and you slowly have to work with these people to bring them back to God. And what are we basing it on? See, so often uh, people base it on what they prefer, not what Scripture says. 
I mentioned earlier that you know someone in pastor's forum said, you know, we don't really believe that stuff about divorce anymore. You shouldn't read that. That was Jesus yes. saying that. Yeah. Well, but you know, you need to soften it. You need to qualify it. Or pick something else, he said. <laughs> really? We pick the things we like mm -hmm. in Scripture? Jehovah's Witness is coming to the door. Yeah, that's, that's, you know, you can talk with them. They'll say, well, you know, we'd like to talk to you about the Bible. Oh, really? What do you want to know? And, and, <laughs> and then you can, you can argue them back, and if you know how to deal with them, you know what their theology is, you can work it, work it back on them to point out that, 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 that it's not scriptural. Yeah. And I, that's, I hate doing that sort of thing for the same reason that I hate to be involved in any trivia contest that involves Bible questions, because expect me to have all the answers. <laughs> This is a challenge for us. I mean, what do we do, especially a family member? Because he says, you know, uh, look at look at what this says. Your own brother, your son or daughter, the wife you love, or your closest friend, stone them to death if they try to pull you away from God. I'm not suggesting we stone people, but I'll, the reason I use that passage is because this is not to be taken lightly. Okay, I've got some other quotes. Uh, we won't, we've got, how much more time do we have? Um, just a few minutes. These, I, I talked last week, in fact, I, I had a couple of slides last week from some things this guy, uh, Jonathan Anye, had written in an article. Now, he is in a non-denominational church. He is a worship leader. He's young. He grew up leading worship in a contemporary Christian worship service. He, I've got several quotes from him I want, to, want your reaction to. He writes, if you were to visit 10 different traditional services, you would probably come away with 10 different ideas as to what exactly traditional worship is. What it values and what it detests, what it champions and what it eschews, what is permissible and what is taboo. But, and honestly the purest in me struggles to admit this sometimes, that's a good thing. It's not all about me and my preferences, it's about meaning. For sure, I do have my preferences, but I've served six churches in five denominations in a paid capacity, and not a single one of them has done corporate worship just as I like it all the time. But at core, all of their worship practices were derived from deep meaning, not preference, that, uh, that I could honor and support on a theological and contextual basis. What do you think of that? Do you disagree? Agree? No. You think he's right? Yes. I think he's right. Mm -hmm. Now he's speaking from a contemporary worship perspective, talking about <laughs> traditional worship. And that's the way I feel. I church shop when I came down here, <coughs> and music was very important to me. And I'd go and say, well, I really like the music there. <laughs> you know, the message wasn't all that great. I just didn't have a good... I mean, and I came to your church, said, oh my God, it's Lutheran music. I grew up with it. <laughs> I grew up with it. I was like, I can't do it. I got my sister's in here. You're going to love this church. I don't like that music. <laughs> but God brought me back. I'm like the other I go, but I love your message. I love the friendliness. I had to give it up. It's like, it isn't all about the music, Joanne. You know, there is no perfect place. Deal with it. Get the meaning out of it. It's, it's not about our preferences. Yes, mm -hmm. it's not about Are we okay with that? I mean, what? how does that relate to, I just didn't, I didn't feel moved by it. I didn't feel, I didn't like the music, so I didn't feel worshipful. Or I didn't like the message, so I really didn't feel I was drawn closer to God. If, at what point do you say, that's enough reason to leave? Well, if you keep going, keep going, keep going, you aren't there, then there is something wrong, whether it's whatever in the yeah. church, or it's you. Right. Then it is a new one, but sometimes it just isn't there. I guess there's just something that left yeah. me. I, 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 I appreciate that. I, there's a, um, another TV show I watched, Justified. There's the, the, oh, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> the guy who is the, uh, the sort of head um, agent in this, um, their marshals, mm -hmm. head marshal in the office, who's a sort of old country wisdom guy. He's got a lot of very funny things. I'm going to adjust the language appropriate to our group here. He says, you know, if you get up in the morning and the first person you meet is a butthead, well, there are buttheads in the world. But if everybody you meet all day long is a butthead, then you're the butthead. <laughs> I think that's true of churches. You know, 
we go to church. Oh, I don't like the music. Oh, I don't like the message there. Oh, I don't like the people there. Oh, I don't like that building. Oh, I don't. At what point does it become your problem? Yes. And you need to deal with it. Okay. Same God. Worship should be inclusive. Churches often spend a lot of time and energy attempting to woo a particular demographic. We're all about families. Or we need a pastor who can bring in the young people. Or we're the church that loves kids. Enough already. Christian worship in its simplest form is the most inclusive and relevant act as its invitation is extended to divine image bearers from every walk of life. Open up the doors. Learn to see Jesus in people you, who don't look like you, don't talk like you, and don't vote like you. <laughs> don't make an idol out of the kids. Love them by nurturing them in this kind of environment. What do you think? We need a pastor who can bring in young people. Session meeting a few years ago when we first started talking about hiring another uh, associate pastor here for congregational care. Somebody said to, in that meeting, well, but if we get somebody else, we need to make sure that they've got gifts you don't have. Like, we need somebody who's compassionate. <laughs> <laughs> Carolyn, is that not exactly what we said? Um, I think I love the fact look, that this is the most inclusive and relevant act, an invitation to extend to divine image makers from every walk of life. To what extent do we, do we add to, take away from, adjust, adapt our worship or our church in order to try to hit all the targets? Is that what he's saying? In some ways, you want to be all things to all men, so that so that you might save some. Save some. There you go. I think you have so that you might save some. There's the other part of it says if you try to hit all targets, you're going to miss them all. You're going to miss them all. So where do you draw the line? And where do you? I completely agree with what he's saying here. Mm -hmm. That sometimes churches are so, you know, when we say you have family at Lakeside, which is our tagline, we hope that's an all-inclusive statement. You know, that that's not going to target, you know, we're the family that loves kids or, you know, we're the yes. family oriented. If you're a single person, you're not welcome. Yeah, exactly. That's, the, that's exactly the opposite of that. Exactly. You're exactly the opposite. You're a single person, we're here for you. You know, we had uh, fellowship groups that we had at our church in Seattle. I remember one time I found out about this and just freaked. Um, it, it turned out that some of the people who were leader of this group, and I was an elder in the church, and so I was had supervisory responsibility for some of the fellowship groups. That one of the groups, the people who were at the door welcoming people, if somebody they thought looked too old, oh. they would tell them, oh, no, no, this isn't the group for you. You want to go upstairs to Skymasters. Well, the weird part was, and this is before I even met Carol and this started, the woman who was doing that most and really advocated that we need to not get these people in here that are too old, when I first started teaching there, they called, I came and started teaching, she said, um, um, Wow, you know, he's really good. It's a shame he's so old. She was four years older than I was. What does that tell you about perceptions? Yeah. Okay. Another quote. Worship is, should be vitally important. I'm a little surprised how often I hear people say that we shouldn't talk about how we should worship. Quote, you're being div divisive over the little things. Well, people out there need to know Jesus. And there seems to be a lot of churches for whom worship is an afterthought, a low expense, low preparation endeavor. But if we don't worship well, we can't live our faith well, and we won't be the church we're called to be. Our time, thought, creativity, and financial investment should reflect the importance of our gatherings. It might seem like a waste, but it's our life and breath as followers of Christ. Do you agree? See why I like this guy? How much do we invest in worship? I think we could invest more. And I don't mean just money. I mean yeah, prayer, thought, time. The church that I had been attending, our services were an hour and a half, not an hour. Mm -hmm. And if it went over, no big deal. The first half hour, we used in worship and song. And then the other hour was used for 
uh, sermon and Bible reading, whatever. So I was used to it, an hour and a half. So that the beginning, when the worship being and the music, it would start out fast, yes. But then it would slow down before the actual service started, which prepared your heart. Like I say, early on, I've had people come up to me when I went seven minutes over and say, you got to stop doing that. <laughs> they don't do that so much anymore because they know I'm not going to listen anyway. <laughs> I mean, I try to stay, you know, I, I try not to go too long. But if it does have to go long, then there's a reason for it, you know. Yeah, um, Jesus put something in your heart to say. You can't, you can't say, sorry, yeah. God, I am. Yeah. <laughs> gotta, get, gotta get done. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, so, what are our priorities? So, and then you, you know, the, the quote up there, you're being divisive over the little things while people out there need to know Jesus. One thing that reminds me of is um, there's been a discussion, and maybe you're going to get into this later on in this whole The series. purpose of the, the church. Yeah, yeah, is the church, is it for Christians or is it for evangelizing? And, and I kind of think it's for the believers. There, there's, a, there's a book that was written on this, and there's sort of a new movement saying that the early church was not primarily evangelistic. While we have the records of when Peter preached, thousands of people came. The church itself was not targeted toward evangelizing. See, today, churches, the Willow Creeks, the big churches, they will have services. Their Sunday morning services are called seeker services. So their whole orientation in those services is for people who are not yet believers, or at least not committed to a church. And then they'll have, like in the case of Willow Creek, they have what they call, uh, what they call it? Um, they talk about the milk and the meat, but they have a family services, they call it, which is the family of believers. And they have that like on Tuesday night or something, where nobody can find them if they're not a private church. I'm just um, but And so they, they draw a very distinct, uh, a real distinction there. And, they, and their focus on Sunday morning is seeker services to, to bring people to Jesus. Well, we are supposed to evangelize. But the question is, what was the primary purpose of the early church? People are starting to ask it, and a lot of them are starting to say the primary purpose of the early church was discipleship and fellowship and worship together. It was not evangelism. That's something that happened as, a, as God led in a separate thing. Mm -hmm. And so does that change what church ought to be on Sunday morning or at other times? Okay, i got one more quote. I'm over a few minutes, but you'll survive. <laughs> you'll survive. This, this came out. Wrong, but okay, the top part. Worship should be determined by theology. Everything we do in corporate worship should be dictated by what we believe about God and God's mighty acts in Jesus Christ. Bluntly, music's job is to serve the liturgy and nothing else. Okay, I'm gonna stop there. I actually thought I was I had it broken up that way, it didn't come <laughs> didn't come up that way. Um you agree or disagree? <coughs> Do you know what liturgy is? I was just going to say, give, you the, give me a definition of liturgy. What do you all think liturgy is? It's the procedure that's going on in the church. Mm -hmm. It's the flow and order of things, and, and what the, it's the content of the service and what each part is supposed to mean and how they fit together. That's liturgy. Okay. I actually made the mistake once of saying to uh, a, a, one of my professors in seminary, I said, you know, well, it's a, it, I go to a liturgical church, because at the time I was attending a, a, um, an Anglican church or Episcopal church. And he said, they're all liturgical. Some have good liturgy, some have bad liturgy. But they're all liturgical. You know, I was thinking of high liturgy in terms of more formal liturgy. Um, so, worship should be determined by theology. Agree or disagree? Yes. You agree? Yes. Yes. I strongly agree. Yes. You can still disagree with me even after I said that. The problem is, most of us don't even know what our theology is. We don't understand why we do some of the things that we do, I think. I mentioned that last week. Why is our pulpit on one side? Why don't we put it in the middle where it's even the distance? That is a very important theological statement about what we believe is important. Church, churches, Baptist, and I'll not be critical of that. It's just a difference. Baptist churches and others for whom the preaching is the most important thing, put the pulpit in the middle. Reformed churches, Lutheran churches, uh, Anglican churches, some others that believe the preaching is important, that's why you have a pulpit, but not the most important. The most important is the sacrament, or it is the, the altar table which recognizes the sacrifice of Christ, whether you have communion every week or not. The altar table is in the middle, below the cross, the pulpit is on the side. There's a theological reason why we do it that way. 
there should be a theological reason for why we do everything. And when we start letting sort of uh, crowd preference determine, and I think that's what he's speaking to, you know, what, what kind of music we like or whatever, when that starts being the thing that, that directs our order of worship, our liturgy, then we probably have it wrong. I love the fact that worship should be dictated by what we, in the, in the public worship, corporate worship, by what we believe about God and God's mighty acts in Jesus Christ. And music is to serve the liturgy. It is to enhance that, not replace it, or be something other than it. Then the second part, worship should tell the Christian story. As I've said so many times, this is our calling, to remind ourselves of who we are as people shaped by the Christian story. Now that gets into the question of what's the purpose of worship? Is it to evangelize? Or is it to remind ourselves of who we are as people shaped by the Christian story? That's not true for somebody who's not a believer. And once we've established these generous parameters, our question is not what is the right or wrong way to worship? Instead, we must ask what elements and forms best represent the meaning of worship. Not what do people like, but what is best in reflecting what we believe should be true about the worship. I really like this guy. Yeah. I'm going to ask you a question. I don't want to answer it today, but I want you to think about it for next week. What parts of worship... And I'm talking corporate worship here. What parts of corporate worship do you find most meaningful? What parts do you find least meaningful? And in what ways? Understand the question? What parts of corporate worship, and it doesn't have to be in our church, it can be that you experience somewhere else. You know, what parts of worship, corporate worship, do you find most meaningful? And in what ways? What part do you find parts do you find least meaningful? And in what ways? My hope is that out of this class, not only will we all learn something together and come out with a greater sense of what worship is, but I want you to help me figure out how can we, as a church, because this is where we are. I mean, how can we worship better? I'm very open to the guidance of the Lord as it's spoken through you all and through our work together to find that. Let me close in prayer. Father God, we are truly grateful for all of your grace. We wish to worship you in spirit and in truth. We wish, it to, we wish to, to manifest in our presence, in our individual lives, and in our corporate lives, um, a true worshiping in spirit and in truth. And we ask you by your spirit to teach us what that means and how we may do it better. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for doing all the work today. Thank you.